Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a very special episode and it's a Father's Day episode. So uh, before we go any further, I have to show you my scent of the day because it's actually dedicated to my father and grandfather because it actually is a bottle that literally passed down uh, through the generations. So my grandfather bought this bottle and gave it to my father who once I started the channel, maybe like a year and a half ago or so, he said, hey, I've got this old bottle uh, of Old Spice. Do you want it? And I said, absolutely, I want it. Um, and he said, take good care of it because it, it comes from, you know, your, your grandfather who he died when I was very young. So I never really got to know him. Um, but it is a very rare flanker of Old Spice called Old Spice Leather Cologne. So my grandfather obviously had tastes like mine, hence the leather. Um, but this is a vintage from Scholten. And I think Procter & Gamble bought Old Spice um, in 1990 or somewhere in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. I can't remember the exact year, but um, the, the pre-Procter & Gamble bottles were Scholten bottles. And um, Scholten made a damn good juice, I'll tell you that. Um this fragrance is very interesting. It's actually really good. It's um, something nobody really talks about. It's something I don't talk about very much on the channel because it's hard to find. And uh, well, I guess that shouldn't stop me from talking about it, but maybe it's because um, it's an emotional fragrance for me. You know what I mean? It's something that uh, is almost like a family heirloom, if you will, because it comes directly from my grandfather. And so, um, I guess this is a good time to say Happy Father's Day, Dad, if you're watching, and I love you. I hope you make it back safe. He's actually uh, traveling back from Jordan. Um, and and so, um, so yeah, so Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there, to everyone who's watching. And, and this is going to probably turn into a little bit of a tradition at Channel Ram, because uh, last year I did a Father's Day special video, and I did somewhere around 20 fragrances, give or take. And that's what we're going to have again today. But last year... It was focused on vintage fragrances for dad, okay? So fragrances that are um, vintage in, most of them are vintage, but some of them were more vintage in smell uh, and idea, if you will. Um, but being this is a vintage channel, I decided to focus entirely on vintages today. But last year's list, I, I go check out the video, but it was things like Patu Porom, Boss Number no. One, New York Intense, Safari for Men, Victor's Wall Street, uh, Derby, Zeno, Heritage, you get the idea, right? Um, now, this list is made up exclusively of vintages. Last year, I included uh, one modern fragrance called Invasion Barbar by MDCI, and um, that was really the only modern outside of New York Intense. New York Intense was a modern, but those smell like vintage fragrances to me. Uh, New York Intense more so than Invasion Barbar, but it still has that, you know, vintage barbershop-y vibe to it. Um, and so this year's list is actually going to focus entirely on vintages. So there is nothing past the year 2000. Everything is from the 90s and before. And many of these are hard to find. Okay, so this is, um, don't, don't come complaining in the comments that I only talk about fragrances that are hard to find. The list is composed that way. This is supposed to be a rare treat for dad to get to wear one of these fragrances. Um, and some of them are still in production. Many of them are discontinued though. So you're going to have to go on a hunt. Okay. That's, that's what I've talked about in previous videos. Sometimes the thrill of the hunt is just as fun as finding a bottle. Um, and so, you know, it, um, it, uh, it, it may take you some time to track some of these down. You're not just going to snap your fingers, click your heels, spin three times and have them all in your collection. You're probably gonna have to do some looking. It's going to take some work on your end and maybe a little bit of money, but, um, Make some notes. I'm sure that you're going to find some bangers in here. So this is going to be another 20 unranked fragrances for dad uh, in, in the vintage mind. So for a vintage channel, this is the type of video I love to do. So uh, real quick, though, let's go back to this Old Spice leather cologne because um, there's no note listing on any of the um, on any of the data databases. There is a there's a listing for it in Parfumo, but there's no notes. Uh, it does say that it was came, that it came out in 1985 and that it was apparently discontinued. Go figure. Uh, I think this got discontinued before Procter and Gamble even bought the brand. So I think any bottle of this that you find will be a 
Shulton bottle. Um, I don't think you'll find anything else, but I did look a couple months back and there were some bottles floating around, but the people on eBay want hundreds for it. Of course, they think they're sitting on a gold mine as they, you know, you can't get this stuff anymore. So for nostalgia purposes, that's how it goes sometimes. Uh, but really glad to have this one. And it smells like there's a little bit of that Old Spice DNA in there. You know, a little bit of that literally aldehydes and spice. And, you know, the spices are God knows what the, what the secret spice blend was. I'll tell you something about Old Spice many people don't know. Uh, Old Spice originally was Old American Spice, and it was marketed towards women. And uh, Shelton did a brilliant move when World War II was uh, in full swing, and they were recruiting companies to send packets to the, to the boys, to the GIs overseas. Um, you know, brands like Gillette came forth with the razors, and, um, you know, uh, Lucky Strike with the cigarettes and all that stuff. Well, Shelton stepped forth. And they did something really smart. They put Old Spice in the package uh, for men. Uh, well, it was it was for women originally, but uh, they gave it to the men. The men wore it. Whenever they got back from the war, what did they do? They continued to wear it. They bought it. They uh, bought it for themselves. Um, and so this is a story very early on. Well, not this. This one was obviously marketed towards men originally, but uh, Old American Spice. If you ever find vintage bottles of that for women, it's basically the same thing. The old old bottles of Old Spice go for big money nowadays, believe it or not. So if you find Old American Spice for women, uh, and people don't know what it is, if you find it for a good deal, go for it. I, I never went for it. I would like to have a bottle, but um, now, now that the secret's out, I very well uh, may have shot myself in the foot, but that's okay. I'm happy with my collection. So um, let's get started with a fragrance that... Um, is deservingly on this list. I did not own this bottle a year ago when I did the Father's Day video for 2022. Um, and so it was a little bit of a, um, you know, a little bit of a tradition that I wear this fragrance every Father's Day. Not this one, but the OG. And and today we're going to highlight Patu Porom Privé. So I wore Patu Porom as my scent of the day for the last like three or four Father's Days. Um, I, um, Absolutely love Patu Pour Homme. Uh, this one adds a little bit of a tr twist to the OG. So this is a flanker of Patu Pour Homme. And the reason that this still goes for $1,000 on eBay is because Jean Carlio was still the perfumer in 1994. And um, he loved using many... <sighs> he loved using many of the notes that ended up being banned... Um, or at least heavily restricted. He was a big fan of huge amounts of oak moss. He was also a big fan of huge amounts of natural sandalwood, Mysore sandalwood. And this is one of the reasons why vintage hunters go crazy for these old Patu Pour Homes, whether it's the Privé or whether it's the OG from, from the early 80s. Um, and so this is this adds a little bit of lavender and hay. And so there's this uh, fougere you know, tint here, even more so than, than the OG. The OG Patu Pour Homme focuses much heavier on the spices like pimento and stuff like that, clary sage and, and sandalwood. It's a, simp it's a simple fragrance, but the ingredients are phenomenal and it's so classy. I mean, you feel like you're stepping into a Rolls Royce wearing it. Um, and both of them are discontinued and both of them fetch very high dollars. Um, but if you don't want to pay big money for this, but you want to sort of get yourself in the ballpark, all right, in the ballpark, it's not the same, but it's in the ballpark, uh, try to find a fragrance for women from Jean Patou called Ma Liberté, and Ma Liberté came out, um, maybe like, uh, seven or eight years before this, I can't remember exactly how long, but it, it almost works like a, um, you know, like a canvas for Patou Pour Homme Privé. Ma Liberté has a brilliant lavender. The thing that Ma Liberté has that this is missing is it has much heavier use of um, vanilla and heliotrope and stuff that makes it feel heavier and thicker and denser. And uh, I bet you a lot of people would actually prefer Ma Liberté. If you're open-minded and you um, and and you uh, love vintage fragrances, I think that Ma Liberté, if you've never smelled it, will knock you for uh, a six. I, uh, I, I know that uh, I... I uh, have been talking about it forever, and I'm glad my brother Rich Mitch got a bottle. He loves it, so we have similar taste. So if you have tastes like us, mine or Rich's, you, you'll um, 
you'll you'll love my liberté but if you're if you're a big spender go for the patu pour on preve it's um it is absolutely fantastic whenever i have big business meetings or something like that you throw that on you own the room so uh that has to be number one on the list even though it's not ranked that has to be the first one out of the gate okay number two actually i'm gonna get some blotters because i want to spray some of these um number two on the list is a fragrance that I haven't talked very much about on the channel. You heard it, you heard about it whenever I whenever I did my perfume planet haul when I was in Houston. That's actually where I got it from. And uh, he left the price tag on 99 dollars um, But I ended up getting this a little bit cheaper because I got a bunch of stuff. Uh, so Francis Denny Inc. is the distributor. And this is Adolfo. Now, this is where I'm a little bit I'm not even 100% sure, but my guess is that this, so this says Adolfo Classic Gentleman Cologne Spray. Um, the original from 1981 was called Adolfo for Men, okay? And I think it comes in a little different bottle. I think the, um, I think the uh, uh, word right here was almost like in a metallic circle, like a metallic uh, sticker looking thing. And it said for men underneath. This looks similar cologne um down here but the bottle looks similar as well but i think the cap may be silver instead of plastic i don't know but i think this is still old i don't think that uh, uh i think maybe adolfo for men was like in in the 80s it ran and then they changed it to adolfo classic gentleman in the 90s and then i think it got discontinued by 2000 or so i'm not 100 percent sure on the history of the house of francis denny but um, I can tell you that this is an amazing fragrance. No notes listed, um, but Adolfo for men. Let's spray this. Oh, so again, no notes listed on Parfumo. Oh, but there's this almost old school, like um, very uh, bright opening with like lemon and and bergamot and you Im immediately get those citruses but you're also going to notice something green hiding underneath so there's either some sort of galbanum or artemisia or something like that and then there's this uh old school floral heart like many of the old school masculines that you find there's this spicy carnation smell with um rose and jasmine and um something else green like pine right uh, and then there's this like leathery, uh, patchouli heavy dry down with some frankincense or something like that. It's fantastic. Uh, even this, whatever you would call it, the, uh, the next version, not the original, not the true deep vintage is, is great. I can vouch for this and it's so classy, but it just has a little bit of, it just has a little bit of, uh, you know, funk to it. Cause it's that leathery mossiness in the dry down but it's so classy this is a perfect fragrance to feature in this video and and one i haven't talked about enough on the channel so adolfo classic gentleman is my bottle but i think the original was adolfo for men by francis denny okay so that is uh number two on the list again this is not ranked so um this is just going in random order if you will uh, so number three, number three on the list is a fragrance that has gotten a lot of talk lately. And I'm going to spray this too, because I want to smell these. It's been a while since I've sprayed some of these. When you have a big collection, sometimes that happens. I need to wear this soon. Um, and this is a discontinued fragrance from 1987. And it is called Hugo Boss Boss Sport. Now... Boss Sport uh, comes in a couple iterations, both in Eau de Toilette. They also had an aftershave, but if you're looking for the Eau de Toilette, one looks like mine with the black cap and this sort of uh, writing right here with the vertical lines that make it look like uh, an old school Boss Number no. 1 bottle. The other one comes in a uh, red cap bottle where Sport is, um, there's no circle here. It keeps the rackets in golf club, but they've sort of changed the design a little bit. They've removed the circle, and Sport is written in red right here above it, um, and there's no vertical lines. So here's the thing. Exact same fragrance, just different 
parts of the world that it was marketed to. Sometimes companies do that. There's no difference between the two. That comes directly from the great Anuj. Trust me, Anuj knows his stuff. He's been in the business for decades and decades. His father was in the business, so he basically lives and breathes this stuff. He says no difference, that this was basically a one-run fragrance, that this, this was uh, marketed by... Um, uh, who who made this? Uh, Ellen Beatrix or Eurocos? Euroco same um, same thing. Um, so let's spray it. Let's spray Boss Sport. So here's the thing about Boss Sport that um, is, uh, it's you know it's one of the best. I think it's one of the best sport fragrances ever, in my opinion. Um, you know. The, um, the opening is so sharp and green and uh, so 80s. You know, it feels like you're walking into a country club with a white Lacoste shirt on and you're going to play 12 rounds, 18 rounds of golf. And um, there's, a, there's a very prominent note of marigold in the top of this fragrance. And when you first spray, that marigold really makes itself known. It's a dry, straw, hay-like smell. That marigold is really good for keeping like aphids and bugs away from like a garden. They don't like the smell of it. Um, but there's a freshness to this as well. So there's, so what makes this so great to me is there is a proper fougere-like structure in the fragrance, the skeleton in the back. And there's all of the heavy notes that I love in a fragrance. So there's tarragon. That's a that's a secret note for me. I love tarragon. Anytime I see tarragon with that sort of oily, anisic quality, I, I absolutely adore those type of fragrances. And it's here. And um, it blends with the marigold and the mugwort and the patchouli and the oak moss and all of the heavier notes that you can think of. But then there's also this sort of citrusy freshness in the fragrance. So there's lemon, there's bergamot, there's mandarin orange. And... Um, those citruses sort of just lead you into the fragrance with a, a classic heart of geranium, carnation, jasmine, lily. So there is a floral heart, um, but there's also clary sage that is um, uh, a little sweaty, a little vintage sweaty clary sage with uh, cedar and sandalwood, musk, amber, and tonka bean. So it has some... Oh, it's so fresh and natural smelling, and yet so completely against the grain of what modern sport blue shower gel fragrances are. This is the kind of sport fragrance that I would want to wear. I love it. I love this type of stuff. Um, Boss Sport. It's interesting. I sent uh, Armando maybe like five or six fragrances he had never smelled. And, you know, he's like, he introduced me to fragrances I, I never got to smell before except thanks to him. And Boss Sport was one of the ones he had never smelled. And of the five or six, and there were some big hitters in there, he was like, this is the best. Boss Sport's the best of the bunch. He's like, I'm buying a bottle immediately. Um, and the fact that uh, this is a fragrance that doesn't get hyped very much in the community. So a bottle of this, Rich Mitch was telling me, a bottle of Boss Sport on UK eBay went for one pound. It was like a auction with no reserve. And no one pays attention. It went for one pound, uh, which is like a dream. And it was the big one. It was the, uh, this is a 50 mil. I think this is a 50 mil. I'm pretty sure this is a 50 mil. But I can't see where it says 50 mil. But I think this is a 50 mil. He said it was the 100 or 125 mil, the big boy. Uh, and it went for a dollar. And, and, you know, that's the dream of every vintage hunter. Uh, and so even if you don't pay the dollar... You know, you pay 40, 50, 60, 70 bucks, 100% worth it. Absolutely 100% worth it. There's some throwback, you know, to the citruses, citrus heavy fragrances of the past too. So, you know, it, God, it's so good. It's just so good. The way that the spices, there's some mace, which mace um, is like the outer part of the nutmeg. Um, it, it's like a, I don't know how you describe it, but um, it like wraps around the nutmeg and they use, it, it has a different smell. Um, so there's mace, uh, there is 
just the way that the the spice and, and the citruses and the florals and the mossiness and the amberiness in the base and the woodiness just blend together. Man, what a fragrance. Okay, so Boss Sport comes in at number three. Again, again, unranked, just going down the list. Next on the list, we've got a fragrance that I have been talking about on the channel nonstop for the last couple weeks since I got it. And I had to put this in the video because, you know, damn it, it deserves to be in the video. This is a great fragrance that no one talks about. Uh, or at least I never hear anyone talk about it. This is Jean-Charles de, de Castelbajac for men. Eau de Toilette. Now, there's also an Eau de Cologne, which I'm sure is amazing. Um, and this is a house that deserves more love. I did a video on... John Charles de Castelbajac, uh, JCC number two, they called it for women from 88. Uh, this is from 82 for men. It is fantastic. It is signature scent worthy. I'm telling you, it's that good. It is um, very uh, slightly animalic, just slightly. There's a little bit of castorium, but I didn't want to include anything super animalic like Koros or, or Antaeus. Although I think those would have worked as well. But um, what, what cuts this is there's this woody, earthy, green quality to the scent. So even though you get a little bit of castorium, you get some aldehydes in the top. You get some green notes, that artemisia and basil and stuff like that, and the freshness of juniper. Juniper is used to um, sprighten up gin, you know, to, to make the gin sprightly. And it has, a, it has this uplifting-like smell to it with um, patchouli, geranium, cedarwood, sandalwood, carnation, old school carnation, makes all the difference, I'm telling you. I wish more, I wish more fragrance houses would use that old school carnation note with uh, oak moss, castorium, frankincense, leather, musk, and tonka bean in the base, but this is, this is worth hunting down, and this is another one like Boss Sport, that if you're a vintage lover, if you're a vintage hunter, um, and and you like these type of fragrances? Get it get it before the bull rush begins. This is uh, this is good stuff. You can easily take a chance on Jean Charles de Castelbajac at number uh, four on the list. Number five uh, is going to be sort of a twofer because we're going to have uh, a fragrance from 1959, and uh, this fragrance, I think. Um, I think is is probably one of my favorite masculines from the 50s, okay? And it's Monsieur de Givenchy. Now, uh, back in the day, all right, uh, back in the day, um, they would release a Haute Concentration version like a decade or two later. So this came out in 1959, Monsieur de Givenchy. I don't know when this one came out is the only thing, but I'm guessing it wasn't like immediately. It was probably like a decade or two later. So, you know, maybe 70, 80, I, I don't know. But um, I love the Haute Concentration version substantially more than the, than the OG. I mean, this is still good, but uh, this fragrance shares a little bit of the same issue that I have with something like uh, Chanel... Poor Monsieur, okay? It just has this uh, lemony, lemon verveiny, um, you know, freshness that just seems to dissipate very quickly. There's no real base to it. Uh, it's a lot of lemons and uh, a little bit of spice. There's pepper and cinnamon. And again, carnation. Again, carnation, very important, uh, with lavender. And this makes it very classic old school masculine. Uh, none of the castorium of Jean Charles de Castelbajac or, or maybe the little touch of leather of Adolfo, none of that. Um, this is very classy, very old school, and I and I really do like it. But this, the reason I just decided to include them both is that if you can ever find this Haute Concentration version, my God, man. So the notes are actually the same, but I don't think they are. You know, I think there's more to this somehow. Um, you can see the color of the juice is darker as well. Um, and it, and it feels that way. It feels darker, heavier, thicker, richer. That's how I like my fragrances like this. Even these citrusy fragrances, I like them to have some depth. Uh, some people compare this to Armani Eau Pour Homme. Um, I don't know. I don't, I've never smelled that one, believe it or not. Uh, and so I couldn't say, but it feels like sort of a vintage, vintage citrus heavy Chypre, a citrus aromatic Chypre. 
is what it feels like to me. So if you've smelled something like Chanel's Poor Monsieur, you'll be in the ballpark, but believe it or not, I like this more. Um, so that's why this is included and the Chanel is not. Monsieur de Givenchy. Mm, what a brilliant fragrance for Father's Day. Classy, that's a classy scent. So maybe one day I'll do a uh, comparison video between the two, but uh, amazing, amazing stuff. Okay, so that was number what? I guess I should have numbered these. Um, that was number five. Number six, and again, no, uh, no ranking here, but next on the list, we'll say, is again, a very hard to find uh, Fougere. And one of like the most, I would say, uh, technically sound Fougeres ever created. And this is Gucci Nobile. So Gucci Nobile um, is raved about by the vintage hunters, and rightly so. Um, Gucci Nobile is, let's spray it. It's been a while since I've sprayed gu old Gucci Nobile. Let's, let's spray some, some high price juice, shall we? So Gucci Nobile is a, there you go. Sometimes the atomizer works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, uh -huh. oh, it's just, you know, oh. It's just one of the most perfect classical um, fougeres. Uh, it is just up and down uh, perfection from top to bottom as far as a fougere goes. If you like classic fougeres, that spicy green quality about a fougere, that uh, slightly woodiness, that lavender that gives off that herbal touch, um, there's a little bit of rosemary in here too, which um, will give a throwback to one of the godfathers of the modern fougere for men, which is Paco Rabanne pour homme. That made last year's list, by the way, because that's my father's signature scent. But there's a little bit of this throwback to, you know, because of the rosemary and, and lavender. Um, but this takes it to a little bit of a different level because it adds mace, it adds tarragon, which again is a secret ingredient for me. I love tarragon. Lemon, fir, jasmine, cyclamen, carnation, geranium, rose, moss, definitely oak moss, patchouli, this is the oak moss I know, vetiver, cedar, um, tonka bean, um, and musk. And so there's a note list, lit, there's a, <laughs> Can't talk today, man. I'm not used to doing these videos in the morning. There's a note missing. And if you actually go through the old, um, if you go through the old packaging, the old verbiage on Gucci Nobile, and look at the note listings that the brand actually put out when this came out, you'll notice that on one of the packagings, and uh, I forgot where it was, but I probably won't be able to find it without doing some more digging. Scanning was the marketer, was the distributor of this, by the way. Um, but there was a note of tobacco listed, and I definitely get that. Definitely I get that tobacco. I think that's one of the things that that makes it so just classically sound. It's so brilliant for a man, and um, maybe a man in a position of authority that wants to, um, you know, project this, this image of classiness about him, right? Um, and I was going to include this fragrance, but since I wanted to keep this a vintage list, I decided not to. But if you can't find Gucci Nobile, and you want to get yourself in the ballpark by a very well done modern niche fragrance, get yourself Bon Monsieur. Bon Monsieur by Rogue uh, will scratch the itch of everyone who cannot find Gucci Nobile anymore. Uh, are they exactly the same? No. But this does a fantastic job of uh, making a fragrance that feels like it was made as a proper fougere in, in the 1980s. Man, sometimes I just love a good aromatic fougere, you know? Mm. Okay, so that is Gucci Nobile, number six. Number seven. Uh, number seven on the list is a Dolce & Cabana fragrance. It's probably one of the um, most modern fragrances on the list because this came out in 1998. 
and it is it was marketed by Euro Italia. I think Alberto Mordias was was is listed as the perfumer on Fragrantica, although there is no perfumer listed on Parfumo, so I honestly don't know. But uh, this is Dolce & Gabbana's By Man, and I absolutely love this stuff. It is one of my favorite um, lavender, modern lavender scents ever. There is a lot of uh, Hedione and uh, Ambroxan and, and stuff like that that sort of makes it really project. This is a big projector, but for a vintage scent, it really is. Um, but for, for the office, this is so classy. There's something so, man, it's hard to describe, to be honest with you. So there's nutmeg leaf. There is uh, pepper. There's artemisia and lavender. And, you know, hedione is an ingredient that basically... Uh, has this soft sort of uh, jasmine-like smell, uh, but it doesn't give you the. Uh, it doesn't give you the. Um, how would you say the? Um, uh, it doesn't give you the indolic side of jasmine. Is is a good way to put it. So it's almost like a. It's almost like a fresher take on jasmine. It was uh, discovered by Fermanish back in the day. I think uh, e even Eau Sauvage in the 1960s, you you know, Edmund Rudnitska claims Hedione was a big part of that. Oh, it's just, it's just so classy. It's so smooth. You know how Invasion Barbar is smooth with that lavender and vanilla. This is smooth with the lavender, Hedione, pepper, Artemisia, and there's this brilliant ambery woodiness in the dry down. Not amber woods, but amber and woodiness. There's guyac wood and sandalwood and a touch of leather. It's it's just brilliant. It's so um it's 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 a fragrance that sort of is everything to everyone because I could see people who who love modern fragrances. I could see people who um like the sort of sweetness in a modern fragrance enjoy this because there is a little touch of sweetness here but it never feels like the way modern sweetness is done you know it feels like um it feels like uh it's a it's a vintage style execution and that's why I love it but it has one foot in the future um with the ambroxan and um I love this stuff man Perfect for the office. Could easily be like an office signature scent. Creamy sandalwood. So good. Um, okay. So that is uh, number... What did I say? Seven. Number eight. Number eight is uh, a Chanel. And I know I said I didn't include Chanel's Poor Monsieur for a reason, but this one I can't include. This is Egoiste. Or some of the older bottles say La Egoiste, if you can find them, but they're all great. Even the new stuff of this is fantastic. Um, oh, so it's got this coriander spice in the opening. And one thing that is great about coriander is, you know, coriander is a spice to me that um, really is a little timid, you know, so you get the spiciness of it, but it doesn't jump in front of the cinnamon. It doesn't jump in front of the rosewood. It allows the other spices to really play their part. There's um. The, speaking of rosewood, the rosewood note in Ego East is absolutely brilliant. I don't even need to spray this to smell it. It is, uh, there's a mahogany, mahogany wood. So it's rosewood and mahogany wood and sandalwood. And this is known as a sandalwood fragrance, but it's so much more because there's tobacco, carnation, rose, vanilla, amber, leather, Jacques Polge and Demachy, uh, created a fragrance that flopped in the, in the box office, uh, sales socked of this. Apparently people didn't like it. But uh, for us, who love vintage fragrances, there's nothing else like this. I mean, there's just, it's so unique in its, uh, in its creation, that oriental. You know, one thing I will say is if you've smelled the creation by um, Jacques Poles from the 80s, if you've ever smelled cocoa, there is a little bit of that. It's almost like a masculine cocoa, if you will. Ego East is like a masculine cocoa, but, um, there, uh, it's, I mean, as far as classiness goes, man, I love this stuff and try wearing it in the summer. Try it. See, see what it's like in the summer. If you have a newer bottle, wear your newer bottle in the summer. It, it just works. Uh, I think it just works. Okay. Next on the list is, um, 
Number nine. Number nine is an Eigner fragrance. So last video I included Davidoff's Zeno, one of my favorite fragrances of all time. I love that style. I love that DNA. I've talked about it on the channel for ever, it seems like. Um, and this is a continuation of that. So Zeno came out in 86. This came out in 87. And it's Eigner's Free Life. So Free Life is... Um, an Etienne Eigner release that really feels like they took Zeno and tried to do just a little twist on it and release it as their own, which is fine. I, I love that DNA, but if you want something a little bit different, but you want to stick to what you love, you love Zeno, um, that sort of amber, I would call it an amber fougere because uh, Zeno has uh, lavender and it has rose uh, and rosewood, and geranium, but it's that sort of patchouli amber vanilla base, and there's a beautiful article on Fragrantica about how Michelle Almarac, who made Zeno, used Shalimar as the inspiration. So Shalimar's vanilla Guerlinade was sort of the inspiration of the base, and they stuck that fougere, um, you know, bit on top with the lavender and clary sage, geranium, rose, jasmine, and lily of the valley, and so what Eigner did is they basically tried to do the exact same thing. There's rosewood, there's lavender, there's rose, there's cedar, there's geranium, there's lily of the valley. You get the bit. The base is amber, patchouli, vanilla, sandalwood. The notes are almost identical, but they stuck a muscat grape note in the top of this. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, all I know is I love it because... It smells like Zeno to me with a little bit of this uh, whiny grapiness. I don't know what a muscat grape smells like, but uh, if it's just like a grape, it's hard to pick out. Uh, if I didn't know it was there, I'd probably wouldn't detect it. I would just say it's Zeno smelling. Um, maybe a little, maybe that grapey, maybe that grape thing gives it a bit of this wine, which again takes my brain into this maybe like honey territory. So maybe it's slightly more honeyed, like, um, but like a honey, like a honey wine, if that makes sense. Um, it's definitely dense and thick and, uh, but I love the ambery fougere blend. It just works. And then it's so interesting to me that then, because last year's list, Heritage was on the list. And so in 1992, Guerlain did their own version of this Zeno Free Life, um, you know, DNA, and they are the, are the creators of that Shalimar base. So theirs is my, you know, Heritage is my all-time favorite version of this fragrance, but it's interesting that there were other companies doing it first, and then Guerlain did theirs. So, but Etienne Eigner's Free Life is definitely worth looking into if you like uh, Zeno like I do. Okay, next on the list, number 10. Number 10 is a Eau de Cologne version. There's also an Eau de Toilette, which one commenter once told me is even better. I've never smelled the Eau de Toilette, but I can tell you this Eau de Cologne is fire. It's fantastic. So I, I can just imagine that uh, the Eau de Toilette is also very, very good. This is from the house of Jean de Prez, and this is called Balaver... I'm sorry. Scratch that. Uh, Bala Versailles is the women's version. This is called Versailles Pour Homme. And you can see Eau de Cologne right there. Brilliant bottle. I love the bottle. Uh, I love when each fragrance used to have its own bottle back in the day. Um, that's another good thing about the, the past. This is a splash. Um, uh, so um, Versailles Pour Homme is, um, to me, came out in 1980. And to me, Versailles Pour Homme is almost like taking a little bit of the modern uh, 80s style DNA with that leathery, slightly animalic style and blending it with the past. And in this case, it's the deep past. So it's uh, something like Aramis Aramis from 1964. Okay, that's that's sort of the style of fragrance that this reminds me of. And of course, Bernard Chant was brilliant in creating these uh, leather chipras he did many that are just absolutely amazing. Um, and But here, they've done some other things to try to make it a little bit different, okay? So they have... 
Oh. <laughs> so, they have um, added a touch of fruit, which I don't know what it is. But there's some sort of fruitiness in here. Um, it could be like a slight mixture of like plum, apple, you know, something like that. But just a little bit, maybe some stone fruit smell. There's pine. There's, um, I think there's galbanum in this. It's not listed, but I think there's some green galbanum with clary sage and pimento, bergamot and lemon, sandalwood and cedar, carnation, of course, geranium, jasmine, cinnamon, patchouli, frankincense, oak moss, musk, amber, leather, vanilla, labdanum, and styrax. Imagine an even greener, but slightly fruity twist on, um, on the original Aramis. That's as close as I can get. I mean, it's its own thing, but that's as close as I can get. Masculine level through the roof. Um, hardly any sweetness outside of the touch of vanilla and amber in the base. But, man, that greenness in the top just, just gives me goosebumps, man. It's so good. This is the kind of stuff that I want to wear, you know, out and about. This is the kind of stuff. Um, it's just a shame what has happened to masculine perfumery nowadays. So, that is... Jean de Plez, Versailles, Pour Homme. Okay, the blotter is marked. So next on the list is a fragrance that I actually have a review on, uh, but I reviewed it off of a decant sent from Anuj. Very kindly sent me a decant. And I ended up finding a bottle for very cheap, so I had to go for it. Um, and this is Burberry's... For men. Now, if you know your Burberry history, okay, Burberry's for men was the very original masculine from the house, the best Burberry fragrance ever created, hands down. Um, the very original one came in a bottle with an off-centered atomizer. Okay, so the atomizer was sort of uh, to the to if you're facing if you're looking at the bottle with the writing on the front, this doesn't have any writing. But uh, if you're looking at the bottle with the writing on the front, the atomizer would be off to the left side, okay? Um, and it's... Um... So, this is a very interesting fragrance to me. Extremely interesting. And it's, again, the kind of stuff that I want to wear. So, I've never smelled the original from 1981. They re-released it in 1982 under a different distributor. The distributor is called Royal Brands. To make it even more confusing, if you go to Parfumo and look up Burberry's for Men, they list both. They have version from 1981, version from 1980, 1992, but they flip the pictures. So this shows as the version from 81. The one with the off-centered atomizer shows as the version from 92. It's actually the other way around. So you can't always believe what you see, but this is a slightly animalic, spicy, leathery, Sheepra is what it, well, nah, maybe that's not true. Let me take that back. Um, it's not a true Sheepra, but uh, it, it, the reason I call it a leather Sheepra is that this has touches of uh, Derby. Touches of Derby, okay? It's not Derby, it's touches of Derby. And um, the reason I say that is if you've ever smelled Derby, you know in the top of vintage Derby, there's this insane mint note that you will get if, if your bottle's intact and well. And there's lavender. Here, juniper, tarragon, bergamot, jasmine, marjoram, pepper, carnation, cedar, patchouli, rose, sandalwood, vetiver, amber, leather, musk, civet, myrrh, and oak moss. So that leatherness in the base, um, it just does such a fantastic job of blending the freshness of sort of the mint and lavender and juniper in the top with the heavier, deeper, leathery, animalic touch from the 80s. But it's not super animalic. Um, it's, it's all blended in. So this version from 1992, fantastic. Brilliant. Uh, I've never smelled the OG. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's great as well. Um, but this is the one I, got, I could get for a good deal. So it's what I got. But uh, very happy with it. And um, so yes, Burberry's for Men, a vintage fragrance that gets almost no talk from the 80s and 90s. Um, so yes, 
Very excited to have this, deservedly to be in this Father's Day list at number 11. Number 12 is, uh, number 12 is a fragrance from the House of Atkinson's. It's the best fragrance from the house, in my opinion. And this is called Duke. So Duke is a fragrance that um, I bought from Le Parfumé years ago. And Duke is um, basically in the same style of Boss Spirit. So Boss Spirit easily could have been on this list. Maybe it'll be on next year's list. Uh, Duke takes that sort of Boss Spirit DNA, if you will. And um, it... So, so, um, so basically what it does is it keeps the very green sort of, uh, opening of Boss Spirit. Boss Spirit does it even better though. Boss Spirit's opening is like a punch in the face and I love it. Um, this keeps the basil and artemisia, uh, that you get from Boss Spirit. Boss Spirit almost feels like you take every green note imaginable. Galbanum, basil, artemisia. Um, mint, cannabis, and just blend it all together. That's that's the opening of Boss Spirit. It's so green and so um, devoid of sweetness. Like they've just sucked the sweetness out with the vacuum. This does all of that, but the opening is a big aldehydic blast along with lavender and rosemary, which sort of grounds it a little bit, makes it slightly more familiar. And they've added a brilliant note, absolutely brilliant, of spruce. The spruce in this, I love spruce. I think spruce is um, completely underrated as a note. I think more fragrances should use spruce. Um, there's a spruce note in uh, Lesson Demodable's Oriental Velours, which I absolutely love. That's my favorite Lesson Demodable I've ever smelled, Oriental Velours. Um, Ombre Supreme is close on its heels, but Oriental Velours is my favorite. Um, with geranium and a brilliant tobacco note. So it's tobacco and patchouli in the heart with oak moss, amber, leather, musk, and cedar in the base. Oh. Absolutely brilliant. Um, the best Atkinson's fragrance, hands down. Hands down. No questions asked. I've smelled some of the other Atkinson stuff and it's shite. Um, in my opinion, this is, they hit a home run. No one talks about it. No one, wear, I mean, I have seen a few videos here and there from some of the vintage heads. Uh, Fragrance Matt did a video like within the last year, I think. Um, but man, what a creation. Shout out to Atkinson's for creating this. Shame it's, uh, discontinued. Okay, next on the list we have number 13. And this is a classic. This is a must-have well, not a must-have. Nothing's a must-have, but it's it. I think you should get a bottle while you can. It's discontinued according to Parfumo, which is absolutely a gut punch, you know. Uh, this is Oscar de la Renta's Pour Louis. And this is one of the OG bottles from Parfums Stern. Um, but honestly, you uh, I, even the newer bottles, I wouldn't get the newest version, but if you can get this one... You can sort of see the difference in the in the in the writing. This one has a dis distributed by Sanofi Sanofi Beauty. If you can get the Sanofi, or if you can get the Parfum Stern, do it. These two are stunning iterations. The newest one, I don't know so much about, but um, I'll tell you what, man, what a fragrance Oscar de la Renta Pour Louis is. It is the type of classic masculine that I want to wear, and it's interesting that. In 1980, it was already coming to this because, you know, this is uh, already starting to lean, starting to lean a little bit fresher, just a bit. So there's aldehyde, sage, juniper, lavender, anise, basil, bergamot, caraway, galbanum, carnation, geranium, patchouli, cinnamon, cyclamen, cedar, vetiver, oak moss, leather, musk, sandalwood, labdanum. So you can see a huge note listing, and you would think by that that it's a big, heavy, leathery powerhouse, and it is, but it also is beginning to shift a little bit. And that shift is sort of uh, indicative of what's to come in the 1980s. It, it, uh, this came out, you know, you have to remember that this came out before Koros and Antaeus and 
some of the other 80s powerhouse bangers. And so it's just, um, it's interesting to me that uh, even back then, already you're starting to see the shift that would ultimately turn into the late 80s, you know, experimentation with a little bit of aquatics to the full-blown 90s fresh, clean aquatic vibe. Um, even in Oscar de la Renta, Poor Louis, you can see, if you pay attention, you can see the shift underneath all of the heavier, spicy, woody, leathery aspects of it. Brilliant fragrance. I, I absolutely adore Oscar de la Renta's Poor Louis. All right, so that was number 13. Number 14. Number 14. This is going to be hard to find, so just prepare yourselves. If you're going to try to hunt all of these down, this one may give you fits. Uh, this is Bally Masculine. So Bally Masculine is uh, one of the greatest fo leather fougeres of the 80s. There, I said it. It is. Um, if you like... If you... If you like... Stuff like um, Francesco Smalto, Smalto Porom, that style of so, sort of like leather fougere, uh, you'll love Bally Masculine. There's there's no notes. All I know is I can I can just tell you what my nose smells, which is some sort of a fougere, some sort of lavender, probably um, uh, geranium, and the usual lavender, a little bit of tonka in the base. But there's this almost leathery uh, suede like feel to the fragrance as well and it almost feels like there's just a hint of bellamy in there like bellamy meets fougere i mean how can you go wrong my favorite leather with a little bit of a fougere touch um and how about the marble bottle i mean how about class all the way um love bally masculine so glad to have a bottle upset that it goes for five hundred dollars to a thousand but a buddy of mine uh on the channel uh, left a comment saying he found a bottle for like 20 bucks. So miracles happen. I'm telling you, you just got to look. That's the thing about this. Like if you just run one search and you're like, oh, I'm not going to pay a thousand dollars. You know, you'll you'll never find the deals. The people who are finding the deals are the ones who are looking. Con I mean, they're checking. It's almost like a daily thing. They look, they check, they see. If there's something there, they act. You know, the money's set aside. And and once you see it at a great price, you you move. That's the only way to build a collection at a good, at a at a fair uh, price. Otherwise, you're going to have to spend a fortune. You're going to have to mortgage your house. Um, okay, next on the list is a fragrance that uh, is officially discontinued according to Parfumo, which makes me very sad because uh, this is a great fragrance, which they ruined at the end. So I see why they discontinued it. They should have discontinued it long before they did, actually. But it is uh, Alfred Dunhill's Dunhill for Men from 1934. And this is a fragrance that, um, so Dunhill for Men, Cologne is what the older bottles say. There's also nothing written on the top of the cap. So if you can find, and that's what the inside of the atomizer looks like. If you can find one of these older bottles from like the 80s or before, do it. This is, oh my God. <laughs> you know, sometimes with a fragrance, I have an intuition. Like, because I smelled this one first, the, the newer one that says Dunhill for men. You know, it, it doesn't say cologne. There's that crappy sticker on the bottom and the top of the cap says the name. And look at the atomizer, completely different, right? Um, and whenever I smelled this, I knew this was a shadow of its former self, period. You don't like it? Too bad. It is. This is an absolute shadow of its former self. This is a travesty that they let this continue on. Um, and so I took a chance. I blind bought a vintage and luckily I got a good deal on it. Um, but the depth, oh my God, it's like night and day. Like this could be a case study on why vintage is superior many times, maybe not always, but many times vintage is superior. Um, that's why I love vintage fragrances. Hardly ever do I get a vintage and I'm like, man, I've... Why did I do that? The modern is just so great. Pfft, no, never. Um, this is sort of like this woody floral leather. Okay, That's how you describe it. Woody floral leather with spices and a brilliant iris note. So it's leather and iris. And I, how many times have I talked about leather and iris fragrances that I love? Leather and iris with old school carnation. 
with lavender, so it's classy. There's a classiness to this. Lavender always adds this sort of professional character to me. Um, lavender, clary sage, the lemon in the petit grand in the top of the vintage. So in the new one, it just smells cheap. It just does. Whatever lemon citrus thing they're using in the top smells like shit to me. Um, I hate it. Absolutely despise it. I don't think it smells good at all. Um, but the, the vintage, the way that they blended the citruses, let me spray this. The way they blended the citruses, the um, lemon and the petit grand. Um, I am absolutely... One spray. I want to conserve the vintage. I mean, I'm going to wear the piss out of this, but I'm going to wear it. So the way that they blended these, uh, these, these citruses in the opening, man, I, I mean, it literally feels like you're crushing like the Petit Grand in your fingers, you know, this, uh, this, this, this sort of, uh, like, like they gave you the, the twigs and leaves and you're the one crushing it. And I mean, the depth, the depth of this fragrance is stunning. Absolutely stunning. Love, absolutely love. And, and as soon as I got it, I was like, spray. And, um, I mean, I knew. I knew right then and there that we had basically been deceived with the newest version. Um, so, I'll do a comparison video one of these two days. And it, and it will not be nice on the new one, I'll tell you that. But, um, yeah, that leathery, woody... It's so classy. For a fragrance from 1934... So classy. If you can find an older bottle, do yourself a favor, go for it. Dunhill Cologne for men from 1934. Uh, would smell amazing for Father's Day. Number 15. Number 16 is a Hermes fragrance. And last year, we got Equipage. And I do think Equipage is a great um, example of what a proper uh, masculine Father's Day scent should be. This is one that is maybe a little bit more modern. I won't call it modern for 2023, but it feels much more modern than some of the other Hermes stuff. And this is Rocco Bar. Now, Rocco Bar, for me, always gets the third wheel. It just does, you know. Eau de Hermes and Bellamy are my... They're my point guard and center on the team. Okay, they just are. They always will be. Uh, that will never change. I don't think ever till the day I die. That's it. Bellamy and um, Oda Hermes. And Rocco Bar gets pushed off to the side. And it's not fair because Rocco Bar is actually a really good fragrance. But one of my favorite executions of a spicy green violet fragrance. Um, the spicy woodiness in this is very modern for a 1998 release. This is also a 1998 release. So these are the two newest fragrances on this list from 1998. Everything else is older. Um, and so the spices and the cardamom and, and everything. And there's a note of cypress in here, which cypress is extremely underrated, underused, kind of like spruce. I wish more fragrance houses would use more spruce and more cypress. Um... And cypress adds a slightly herbal medicinal facet to it, but uh, it is it it there's like this medicinal health benefit to cypress. That it feels like you know it feels like you're breathing in something that's like cleansing you. Uh, but being in the forest, just imagine standing in a forest with the fir, balsams, pine trees, you know, birds singing, sun shining on you. But then you're wearing a fragrance that has this sort of benzoiny, ambery. Uh, vanillic sort of um, base, okay? And I get a lot of that from Roca Bar. A lot of people talk about how much spices and woods they get, and, and, I, and I completely agree with that, but uh, really for me, it's the coniferous bits are there, but it's that benzoiny vanillic base that really makes Roca Bar what it is. And it's a very distinctive fragrance, but I see this will always be third wheel. It'll always be pushed to the side as a third wheel sort of thing, but as far as classy scents for dad, oh, 100%. You cannot go wrong with Aroko Bar. Um, there's a little bit... There's a slight animalic 
for something so modern, let's say, there's also a little bit of this, you know, this came wrapped in a horse blanket. I don't have the blanket. Uh, I wish I did. But uh, there was like this horse blanket wrapping around these older bottles. This is what the older bottles look like. The newer ones just look like the modern Hermes bottles that you've all seen a million times. Um, the ones I show, Bellamy, Vetiver in, and, and Equipage Geranium, they look like that. Um, it's still available for purchase, so you can still go buy Roca Bar, and it's still good in its modern for iteration. Um, so it's gone through basically three bottles. It, it, one that looks like this, one that looks like uh, the, the first reformulation of my Bellamy bottle that I've shown, and then the modern one with the black cap. Um, and they're, they're all good. I don't think you have to hunt for a vintage on Roca Bar or anything like that. Um, but this was a trio. This is a trio of perfumers. So this is um, Giles Romney, Bernard Bourgeois, and Jean-Claude Elena uh, making sort of a, um, an introduction to his future Hermes career, let's say. But this is nothing like the future Jean-Claude Elena scents will be. This th There's a much heavier you know, density to this fragrance from the benzoin and the vanilla and, and the patchouli and stuff like that. But fantastic fragrance. And very few people are walking around smelling like this anymore. So Arocco Bar from uh, 1998 comes in at number uh, 16. Number 17 is another Back to the Deep Vintages. And um, this is an example of getting lucky. I, I found this bottle for $100 within the last couple years, uh, I believe. And maybe two and a half years, but somewhere in that range, two and a half, within the last two and a half years, let's say I bought this bottle, hundred bucks on eBay. Uh, and it was an auction and there was like one person competing against me and he just kind of gave up at a hundred. And I, and I won, and I won this, this is Calvin by Calvin Klein. And this is the true deep vintage, the, um, Calvin Klein cosmetics corp. And you can see cologne right there. So I am in love with this fragrance. I think that this is one of the best Calvin Klein releases ever, um, along with Obsession for Men, uh, which I adore. The deep vintage of Obsession is, oh God, it's so good. One of the best just like musky uh, fragrances that the designer houses have put out. You could put Obsession for Men right next to Musque Ravageur, you know, vintage bottles of both. And, and I think they really shine. Now, of course, they can't compete against the true musks, the uh, real Siberian deer musk and stuff like that. Totally different world. But for the designers, great musk. Um, but this is my favorite Calvin Klein fragrance. Um, and many people may not see the appeal in this because it feels like a um, so Rich Mitch did a video on this and actually I remember when he started his channel and he had his channel before I started mine. Um, oh, I wish you guys could just smell this right here. That right there. It is. Oh, fuck me, man. So whenever Rich Mitch started his channel, I remember saying, dude, there are no reviews of this online. None. Go do a review. Like, it's a shame there are none. And I think his review is still, like, the only true review on, on YouTube. Um, and what's so amazing about this scent is that uh, it is perfectly indicative of the year 1981 for me. So, in 1981, if you wanted to wear something that wasn't Coros or Antaeus, what did you wear? You wore stuff like this, or you wore, like, Santos de Cartier or something like that, right? Uh, something that still had some class to it. But even the ones with class had funk that were released in 81. They just did. And this has this unbelievably relaxing... Oh, fuck. It has this unbelievably relaxing sort of uh, chamomile opening. So, you know, chamomile tea, you drink it to calm down. And there's this chamomile-like smell in the opening with green mugwort. So remember that green shout-out I gave to... Duke, that very green opening, uh, but there's a freshness to it. So the chamomile and neroli sort of work in combination to add this beautiful freshness to an otherwise very heavy, sharp opening. Um, and there's orange blossom as well. But one of my favorite, one of my favorite executions of neroli and orange blossom is right here. And um, 
IFF made this. I don't know who at IFF, but IFF made this. And there's some uh, vervain, cinnamon leaf, geranium, tarragon, oak moss, moss, patchouli, sandalwood, and vetiver. And so, you know what it's like? It's like, um, it's like, it's like uh, you're, you're sitting in your bed. Maybe you have a TV in your room and you're, you're laying there after a long day's work and you have your feet up and you are just flipping through the TV in your element, just relaxing and everything's perfect. And then a more perfect situation comes because the woman of your dreams, the woman you love, the whatever, whoever your significant other is, comes and lays with you. Okay. And it's your, everything in that moment is just perfect, right? That's the vibe I get from Calvin. There is a little bit of this, oh, the quality of the ingredients is outstanding too, but there's this earthiness, there's this um, mossy, definite amounts of real oak moss in here, so textured and, and full. But the way that the chamomile adds that relaxing vibe to it in the top is just unbelievable unbelievable scent um i'll review it one day but uh very happy to have rich mitch's review for, for reference uh calvin by calvin klein from 1981 at number 17 number 18 is a fragrance that actually feels very similar to calvin whenever i added calvin i was like i'm gonna add this one too because they both belong uh this one adds a little more spite um a little more leatheriness into the dry down but it is also a leather fougere so remember i said that um this is one of the greatest leather fougeres of the 80s. This is the other one, in my opinion. Kipling by the House of Parfums Wheel. Vile. Um, oh, fuck. I'll tell you what, man. Seriously, uh, let me get another blotter because I want to spray this. I... There are two fragrances from the House of... of oh, from, from House of uh, Veal that um that deserves so much more love in in the vintage fragrance community one is veal pour from 1980 and i think veal pour um and this from 81 okay even though it's the 92 version it's an 81 creation burberries and veal pour um really influenced derby all right so Guerlain's derby Guerlain just took that style and they added the Guerlainade and they added the know-how and the, in the you know, uh, historical like expertise on making it like posh, you know, a Guerlain, a proper Guerlain. But that style was similar to sort of Heritage. The style was uh, implemented previously by other houses, but they really did execute it brilliantly. And um, this is a fragrance that follows in that in that type of mold, that footstep. So this is not the first, this is not the first fragrance to do a, a, a true leather fougere, but the execution of this, I really need a bigger bottle to be honest with you. Um, the, the fact I only have 30 mils of this really kind of makes me nervous because I never want to be without this. This is, fuck man. So it opens up instantly, sort of in your face, smells a little bit like civet, even though there's no civet listed. It smells a little bit like you get civet, lavender, leather, right off the get-go with green notes. So in that greenness is that Artemisia. And Artemisia can sometimes have that very sharp green opening, you know, but it's cut with the freshness of juniper and bergamot and lemon. And, and that's why I think that this fragrance can be worn in summer. Um, of course, old school uh, carnation, geranium, basil, pine, because it's green. It's a green, proper fougere that's earthy and uh, woody. But, you know, there's something about um, both of these that just remind me of each other for some reason. I don't know why. I think it's just the way that the notes sort of come to your nose. Um, it's, it's, they're, they're not the same fragrance, obviously, but they give me a very similar feel for whatever reason. I don't know why. Um, 
because there's very little leather feel in um, Calvin. It really focuses more on the spicy green aspects, whereas with Kipling, it's much more leathery spicy. And yet, I guess it's just the similarity with the... Um, and by the way, there's no lavender listed in Calvin. I think there's absolutely lavender in there. Um, but yeah, I don't know what it is about those two, but man, if you have my taste, you cannot go wrong. Any of these lists, any, anything from this list, you can't go wrong. But, uh, one time I was wearing Kipling, uh, and my neighbor walked up to me and said, dude, you smell like my uncle. And I was like, all right, your uncle must smell fantastic, dude. That's exactly what I want to smell like. Um, is I, I don't want to smell like the modern bro at the mall. You know, take me back to the time when times were better, please. Uh, take me back. So, yes, I love that. I love that. I love being able to, like, be distinguished by something like that. You know, it really shows your personality. You're not some, um, you're not some uh, NPC that just, you know... Only, only gets your news from CNN, and you know you're someone who has a brain, thinks for themselves, right? And that's what wearing these type of fragrances sort of um, uh, it reminds me of, anyways. It it's just a little like hint into my personality. So uh, that is Kipling Wheel by number eighteen. Number nineteen is a one of the best lavender fragrances of all time, and it is Jean Marc Sinan's. Version original. Can you see that? Version original. Now, the vintage bottle has gold right here. This is what you want, the gold. Uh, the, the newer formulation, which only, I think this lasted for about five years. From 1984, this came out. And then um, they released sort of a newer version, which did not have the gold here. It's all black. And, but that only lasted a couple years, I think, and then they discontinued it all together. And what makes this hard to find fuck, um, is that this uh, was created by a gentleman, John Mark Sinan, who I'm going to say sort of had a little bit of a breakdown. Okay, I don't know what happened to him, but whatever it was, he was competing with Chanel and Guerlain. Like he was competing with the big dogs. He was there. And then he decided, you know what? I don't want to do that anymore. And he made it his life's work to round up every single bottle of this and destroy it. That's what he wanted to do. He he literally bulldozed 100,000 bottles. I don't know how many he was able to find. But um, fa found him, found his, bought back as much stock as he could and destroyed it. Said, I don't want to do this anymore. And went to go be a painter or something. Now, apparently, he still sells some fragrances in his little art shop or whatever that he does bespoke, I guess, or I don't know how it works, but um, that's why these are hard to find, is that uh, there was a bunch of these floating around, and he tried to get rid of them all. I don't know I don't know what happened with him. I have no idea. Uh, no clue what was going through his mind, but uh, what a mistake he made, because this is brilliant. Almost masterpiece brilliant. It has this sort of... Um, Lavender in a thunderstorm feel. So imagine standing in a lavender field, dark 80s lavender field. Okay, that's the feeling to me. None of the modern lavender, dark old school lavender with um, this peppery muskiness and woodiness and slight animalicness. There's carnation, there's jasmine, there's lavender, there's rose. And the pepperiness just sort of feels like you're just being pelted with rain, you know, like the storm is coming and you can see it, but the lavender smell is just so brilliant. You can't leave the field. It's just fantastic. Um, fantastic. Sad. This is only a 50 mil, um, but I'm very glad to have this and I will do a full review one of these days. And that leaves number 20. So I started with Patu Porom Privé, started with a special one. I'm going to end with a special one. I think that this is uh, one of the greatest masculine scents ever made. Uh, I included Heritage in last year's list. So this year's list, it's going to be Abbey Rouge by Guerlain. Now, um, I'm holding an Eau de Cologne bottle. Uh, I will tell you that if you can find an Eau de Cologne, my God, man, uh, the Eau de Cologne uh, bottle 
has the ability for some, I don't know how, but it, to my nose, it has the ability where the citruses are brighter and fresher and the heavier notes in the bass are deeper and heavier. How it plays that trick, I have no clue. If you can't find the Eau de Cologne, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the modern Eau de Toilette, at least in these bottles. I've never smelled the new ones in the Low Medial Square bottles, but these Listerine bottles or whatever of Abbey Rouge, now I'm talking about the EDT, the EDT and the EDC, Eau de Cologne. These, these are the two. Um, do not get the Eau de Parfum. I mean, the Eau de Parfum is not a bad fragrance, it's just not... It's not Abbey Rouge. It's harsher. Um, it has an oud note in it, apparently. Um, uh, I, I'm i not a big fan of the EDP, but the EDT and the EDC are masterpieces. One of the greatest masculine fragrances ever made, ever. It takes that, um, it takes that DNA of uh, Shalimar and it uh, basically adds this. Um, I want to spray this. I want to spray this too. So it takes the. Um, so it takes that. Uh, oh, God. So it takes that vanilla DNA of, of uh, Shalimar, if you will. Fuck. And it adds one of the most brilliantly executed lemon-rosewood combinations I've ever smelled. Um, lemon and, and, and rosewood. Um, and... Um, it, uh, to me, Abbey Rouge is a, um, it's really like a master class in masculine perfumery because in 1965 when this came out, probably some people smelled this and thought, this is too feminine because it has that vanilla, you know, in the base and the red in the bottle was supposed to represent this, um, red hunting jacket, apparently, that, um, that, that hunters would be given when they became like a master hunter status. Um, and so the, the, the lemon rosewood opening just knocks my socks off. But then of course you get the rest of the Gar Garlon little touches. So there's a little patchouli, there's carnation, of course, one, oh, also one of the best carnation scents ever. Carnation in this is executed to pure perfection. I mean, fuck, man. Sandalwood, cedar, rose, cinnamon, but it's that vanilla, you know, Shalimar base that mixed with a little bit of leather. And that's the thing is there is a leather note. It comes out a little bit more prominently in the Eau de Cologne. Okay, so the leather note from my experience, comes out a little more prominently in the Eau de Cologne than in the Eau de Toilette. Actually, even if you can find an older bottle of the Eau de Toilette, like I've got a 90s bottle, a splash of the Eau de Toilette, and it feels um, like the leather comes out a little bit more as well. It's a little bit more rough and tumble, whereas the more modern Eau de Toilette, which I think this is a bottle, this Eau de Toilette that I have is a bottle that is probably within the last 10 years or so. It's uh. 9T02 on the batch code, 9T02. Um, so I think this is a bottle within the last 10 years or so, but they've modernized it a little bit for modern taste. You know, they've, um, uh, this, the, the uh, base doesn't have as much of that harsher leathery feel, which, which I like. So I usually wear like the more modern EDT in the summer and I wear the more vintage style fragrance, more vintage style bottles, the older EDT or the Eau de Cologne can be like, I guess more, but Eau de Cologne, I mean, you, this is any winter, any day, any, any season, winter, summer, spring, fall, and this is a signature scent. That's why this is uh, last on the list. The first one and the last ones are the only one I put in a place. Everything else I just sort of spread around. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the Father's Day extravaganza video. Put a lot of work into this one. 
Uh, I hope you found some sense that you can go try to hunt down or sniff one day. Uh, God, Abby Rouge, man. Fuck. So, thanks to everybody for the support. I can't believe we are already on year two of the channel. Uh, I will tell you guys this, that if you're newer to the channel, I get people all the time saying, hey, I just found your channel, love the content, go back and watch some of the old videos because I have put out more content probably in the last 18 months than most channels have put out in 10 years. So if you like this type of content, go back and watch the older videos, go back and watch my previous portfolio of videos um, and there's a lot of good stuff in some of those older videos. Don't write them off because it's not a brand new video. There's good stuff in there. So to, to my, to my, uh, folks who have been with me since the beginning, I very much appreciate you guys still watching and commenting. Hope you all have a very happy Father's Day. Cheers, guys. Catch you next time. Bye-bye.